Hi there. It's uh, week four of Paulian Provocations, a little reading guide uh, for this week when we take up uh, McCulloch chapters four and five and uh, Jantz chapters four and five, uh, the first few centuries of uh, the history of Christianity. Look forward to uh, your papers on the topic of gender in particular. Uh, my writing or my remarks today will be more broad ranging and just lift up a couple elements uh, to consider for uh, for the conversation and uh, questions from the readings. Starting with an assertion by McCulloch on page uh, 114 <clears throat> that Christianity was not going to make a radical change to existing social distinctions. Now, that's an important uh, and broad generalization, and you might intuit that it in fact differs somewhat from the interpretation that we'll find in Jantz, and I think that's actually a really good thing uh, to be exposed to the diversity of uh, early Christianity and the difference in interpretive approaches uh, to that history as well. After all, Christianity, although it was, of course, one holy Catholic and apostolic, uh, was, the was the result of the debates and labors of human beings a lot like us, in other words, uh, fallible, frail, uh, and uh, sinful. So let's start with Paul then. Uh, page 117, Paul is inconsistent about the status of women, McCulloch asserts, and if you're familiar with the Pauline writings, uh, both those that are um, clearly authentically Pauline and those that are in debate as to whether or not they actually came from Paul, uh, and I'll leave that up to my colleagues in New Testament uh, to introduce you to if you're not familiar with that important distinction. Uh, nevertheless, um, what we see in Paul uh, and in early Christianity uh, from the evidence that we have is that uh, Christianity clearly began by giving women a newly active role, uh, as McCulloch puts it, and uh, underneath the surface of what uh, he, he teaches that perpetuates the hierarchies and uh, patronage system of uh, the Roman Empire. There's also a pretty clear affirmation of mutuality in marriage uh, in Paul and in early Christianity, which I think is really important to lift up uh, as we continue to debate how uh, power uh, connects to uh, marriage. Uh, marriage, after all, is something recognized now by the state and uh, that legal status uh, is very much <clears throat> uh, up in the air uh, for some uh, Christians uh, these days and has been for some decades uh, now as we debate uh, marriage equality. <clears throat> um, recognize also, as McCulloch puts it, that in the records of early Christians, we're hearing one side of an argument. Uh, that is, the side that has prevailed is the one that by and large comes down to us. This is also why I'm asking you to read some of those sources that uh, are not necessarily among those who prevailed because they reflected a perspective among Christians um, who self-identified uh, as such. That is, these are followers of Jesus. These are their interpretations uh, if, of his life and uh, teachings. And therefore, I think at least by way of comparison and contrast, uh, can uh, be helpful to us uh, in our uh, ministry and public leadership as well as we shape uh, Christian ethic. Uh, so McCulloch puts it like this, page 121, wherever there were Christians in the second century world, many of them could have been, I would say would have been, labeled Gnostic by the likes of Irenaeus. So be careful with that designation, uh, in short. It's a designation that uh, is associated with the victors of a particularly intense uh, debate within uh, the history of Christianity, um, in which we, by and large, hear only one side of the argument. One thing worth pointing out is uh, that the Gnostic hatred of the body um, is drawn directly from Plato. And as McCulloch points out on page 125, ran against the whole tendency of Jewish religion, which does not share, by and large, the sort of body-soul uh, dualism or the emphasis in the afterlife uh, that we find in um, early Christianity. Recognize also the canon, creed, and the uh, emergence of hierarchical orders in ministry uh, our boundary mechanisms, in most cases, drawn directly from uh, the empire and its um, uh, practices. 
the rule of law, obviously canon um, uh, law, uh, creed, these uh, doctrinal statements that were emerged through political debate um, by and large, uh, and then the uh, orders of the ministry. And uh, McCulloch does a pretty nice job of tracing the changing uh, character of those uh, uh, of the nature of the ministry in the early church. <clears throat> Take um, partic pay particular attention there to uh, uh, First Clement. Uh, it's mentioned on page 132, from which the notion of apostolic succession really uh, takes root. And then also the letters of Ignatius, uh, Bishop of Antioch, uh, where the um, what McCulloch calls, and this isn't his designation, but it's one that's widely used, the notion of the monarchical uh, episcopacy, epic, episcopacy uh, uh, originates. And uh, if you just take a look at clerical garb, uh, especially, um, you know, bishops are increasingly invested uh, with the kind of robes and garbs associated with uh, Roman imperial uh, officials and uh, take on a corresponding status within the alternative um, hierarchy uh, of the church that runs parallel to, intersects with, and also uh, contradicts that of the empire in some ways. Um, page 136, the uh, first um, evidence of an excommunication. Uh, Note well, McCulloch uh, talks about this as a, clearly a punitive uh, power grab um, by um, Victor, the Bishop of Rome uh, at the time. Um, pay some attention to the discussion on page 138 and following about Montanism. This will become particularly important if you're going to write on Perpetua, which I encourage you to do. I think that's a, an astounding story and uh, well worth uh, your consideration. That is the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas and the account that comes to us directly from Perpetua, probably filtered through Tertullian's hands, but nevertheless, uh, a woman's voice uh, quite clearly articulated uh, in the literature of early Christianity and therefore worth uh, paying attention to, despite the fact that she was um, identified with Montanism, which is itself a heresy, uh, and, uh, and it was one of the um, movements uh, ruthlessly suppressed uh, in the third and fourth centuries uh, precisely because of the role of uh, female prophetesses uh, such as Perpetua. Uh, so uh, be careful how you answer that question about <clears throat> why haven't you heard a sermon uh, about uh, Perpetua. It uh, says a lot about the ongoing um, struggles uh, of women uh, to find uh, voices uh, that speak clearly to the structures of power that uh, oppress and suppress them um, in society and a church. Um, finally, from chapter four, um, note the emergence of apologists of uh, Justin, Irenaeus, and Tertullian, defining those boundaries by using the categories of Greek uh, philosophy. And then a uh, long discussion in McCulloch tells you something about his uh, ideological uh, proclivities and bias. Long discussion of the Alexandrian theologians, Clement and Origen. Um, Clement, who um, gave us in particular um, the understanding of Christian stu stewardship of wealth in his essay, uh, Can a Rich um, Person Be Saved? Rich man in this case. Um, uh, and uh, Origen, who emphasized especially uh, universalism, all will be saved since all come from God. And then on uh, page 151, um, really applies the notion of allegorical truth uh, to the heart of uh, Christianity. Uh, and there's a wonderful quote there, you know, that's which starts as, who is so silly? Uh, take a look at that. It's quite a cutting uh, irony uh, and a, uh, a, a rather clear um, critique of the so-called um, literal method of interpretation uh, that continues to be uh, applied today, which misses precisely that most of Scripture is true um, as allegory, that is a literal reading of most of scripture finds its truth precisely in its allegorical uh, character. In other words, it would, these are intended uh, allegories by people who understood um, multiple um, uh, avenues to meaning, uh, not simply the literal scientific historical uh, approach. So that's chapter four, chapter five, um, McCulloch 
Early Christians, uh, 156, frequently negative attitude toward military service is worth considering. Of course, that changed uh, very quickly uh, once Constantine uh, converted. <clears throat> uh, and then 159 to 65, a long discussion uh, about um, baptism and Eucharist as mysteries or secrets, uh, analogous to uh, other mysteries circulating in the um, late Roman Empire, such as Mithraism uh, and Manichaeism, uh, and how important burial was as a way to mark and uh, organize uh, the Christian community. This has become uh, increasingly uh, significant. Uh, and then how Christians became known precisely by withdrawing from uh, society, by perpetuating secrets uh, and uh, their con constancy in the face of suffering and intense celebration of martyrdom. More about that uh, very shortly. Um, note that at least uh, among some of the earliest martyrs, it was clearly an anti-imperial um, assertion, uh, such as uh, Spiratus, I do not recognize, he asserted, the empire of this world. Uh, that is an assertion that uh, would get you killed uh, back then and would certainly uh, gather you some scorn uh, if you said it in some uh, U.S. football stadiums uh, these days as well. Just a little aside there. Persecution then really did ramp up. It was hardly um, the norm uh, for Christians in the Roman Empire, but under Decius, uh, 249 to 260, and then especially under the great persecution of Diocletian from 303 uh, and until Constantine's uh, conversion. Um, and note how this, are, this leads to a great tension that it continues to endure in Christianity between those who give way, who are lapsed, that is, who accommodate themselves to the religion of the empire, and uh, those who uh, do not. And then the debate, what do you do um, afterwards? Um, with uh, people who have lapsed and how do you respond uh, in a way that both preserves the integrity of faith and, uh, and, and yet also is pastoral in relationship uh, to uh, the community. And this is where the Donatist controversy come, becomes particularly important <clears throat> in relationship to baptism uh, with uh, long uh, implications down to today. 179 and following, um, McCulloch takes us into the uh, really important uh, Syriac um, strain of Christianity, um, using especially the archaeological evidence from the Church of Dura Europas. Uh, note well, uh, the absence of a crucifix uh, from early Christian art, um, McCulloch rightly points out that when Jesus was represented in early Christian art, it was as a living figure, um, generally uh, not um, on uh, the cross and uh, the, the empty uh, cross also wasn't uh, widely used uh, as a symbol for Christians. Only after the conversion of Constantine does this become the case. Um, also, uh, Tatian, page 181, uh, the Syri Syriac harmonization of Gospels is important to point out because uh, many of us live in a mental framework that does, in fact, harmonize the Gospels. It was Tatian who first uh, wanted to overcome those uh, difficult, thorny uh, contradictions and theological emphases that cut across the four Gospels and then, of course, all the others that didn't make it into the canon uh, in a uh, nice, neat and tidy uh, harmonization. <clears throat> And then finally, from the Syriac tradition, uh, the importance of the hymns and chants as an expression of faith uh, will be trying to lift up from time to time uh, music as a central aspect of Christian life, as a um, crucial form of prayer uh, in and of itself with the uh, uh, same integrity as uh, spoken prayers and uh, preached prayers, if you will. <clears throat> All right, uh, enough for uh, McCulloch then uh, to uh, the chapter, chapter four, uh, the Burris and Lyman. Um, page 122, which is really where they restate their thesis, uh, namely that Christianity effectively subverted elite privilege and imperial authority. So Burris and Lyman uh, pushing against a little bit uh, McCulloch's assertion about how easily Christians were um, accommodated themselves uh, to the empire. And yet, Burris and Lyman also do add that Christian communities actively embraced imperial patronage and affirm class privilege. So understand that this debate between culture confirming, uh, conforming and culture um, 
transforming or resisting um, styles within Christianity or uh, theologies within Christianity is hardly new uh, and something we can learn from um, for our own ministries and practice by studying those who've gone before us. Um, particularly like what Burris and Lyman point out, that uh, the, the narrative of the increasing you know, unification of the church around these uh, uh, creeds and the, the canon and uh, structures of ministry really differ uh, quite dramatically when you get down to the local level. And I think this is probably very much true uh, today, what um, it means to be an ELCA Lutheran. Um, or a Southern Baptist or a, a member of the AME uh, probably differs quite a lot uh, depending on uh, all kinds of interesting local uh, factors that are often obscured in the sort of meta narratives and grand narratives that historians uh, put together. I especially like what Burris and Lyman drew out of their uh, emphasis on you know, sort of changing the narrative of history, namely that when you look locally, um, and at the grassroots, what you discover is a flexibility and a creativity uh, that is uh, very much in need uh, in today's uh, churches and uh, in, in, indeed across the broader church. I think the absence of that flexibility and creativity uh, is also uh, part of the critique uh, by the nuns uh, who have absented themselves from Christianity uh, because it tends to be uh, inside the box and uh, they see Christians as you know sort of locked into dogma of one kind or another and not really speaking to or addressing the issues of uh, grave concern uh, that they see around them in flexible and creative ways <clears throat> and that includes of course through collaboration with um, uh, other religious traditions and ecumenically and so on and so forth finally then uh, chapter five in um, the Jantz book on uh, martyrdom. Great question on uh, page 133, uh, which asks, is martyrdom a constitutive part of Christianity? Um, seeing martyrdom as such, that is, as a central uh, defining element of uh, how Christianity emerged, uh, helps us understand its differentiation from Judaism, on the one hand, where that was not at all uh, the uh, expectation uh, or norm, although, of course, there were those heroic figures uh, in the Maccabean revolts and others who were revered and remembered. Uh, but uh, by and large, this sort of um, anti-imperial um, martyrdom was not a uh, constitutive part of Judaism and may have led to the break uh, between the two traditions, so the argument goes. And point out also um, how the author's em author's author emphasizes how martyrdom coincides with the rise in imperial Christianity. So as you get more and more people accommodating to empire, you have more dr dramatic and performative um, imitations of Christ. Uh, and it's important that uh, the martyrdom accounts are always sort of mirroring um, that of Christ and sort of compared to and um, narrated in conjunction with uh, stories of Christ. Uh, now, of course, what happens as uh, these stories begin to multiply and become increasingly important is that uh, the threat of martyrdom from the empire is by and large now gone. Uh, so what you have here is something similar to what you see in the history of monasticism, where as more and more people are accommodated uh, to, uh, the, to the empire and to cultural norms, you find um, countercultural um, aspects or avenues uh, within Christianity emerging, of which monasticism is clearly one celibacy, as we saw last week in the Acts of Paul and Thecla, <clears throat> and uh, martyrdom uh, itself as a performative act of um, Christian devotion. Now, to wrap up, uh, then, what does it all to say about gender? Uh, I'll look forward to your uh, responses uh, to, you know, how gender developed, emerged, and was understood within early Christianity. Um, <clears throat> in the past, I've used a text by uh, Barbara McAfee entitled Her Story. Um, Women in the History of Christianity, I believe, is the simple title of the book. Uh, and according to McAfee, there are some, it's pretty important to trace the changes 
uh, from the earliest years of uh, Christianity, from Pauline uh, mutuality to uh, what happened um, post uh, Mon the Montanist movement in particular. So um, look forward to your papers. Uh, please don't hesitate to be in uh, touch uh, with any questions. Also encourage you to work with each other on uh, final projects ideas. I know there are a couple uh, clusters of projects ideas that may uh, turn into group projects and that would be uh, advantageous both in learning how to collaborate and cooperate uh, and also in saving me um, time in grading and reading. I hope these are valuable to you uh, and uh, please give me some feedback on that midterm. You can do so anonymously um, or uh, directly. Uh, I'd value feedback. All right. Um, it's been a full week uh, here in Wisconsin and another big uh, week coming up. I led a retreat this weekend up in Eagle River in northern Wisconsin for about 50 people. And uh, this week I'm organizing a service of resistance uh, through singing the spirituals with uh, one of my new friends here, a singer-songwriter um, by the name of Tim Dorsey. He's a really gifted uh, man and um, happy to be able to bring him to our uh, church to do some gospel and spirituals. If you're interested in seeing the structure of the service, be happy to send it to you. Um, peace.